Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 43. This episode is Tom Spina from uh, Tom Spina Designs and Regal Robot. Now, I think this may be the riffiest podcast I've ever done. Tom is so funny, and we just bounced off each other the entire time. And when I was when I was editing this show, I was just cracking up because we just it is a it's the it's our new podcast. This is the beginning of a I'm talking here with uh, Tom and Brian. Uh, you'll get, you'll get that reference when when we get going. But uh, we cover a whole lot of things, guys. He's uh, born and raised on Long Island, so we talk about New York and common misconceptions uh, about that. Um, his, uh, beginning interest in prop making, set making, costumes, all that stuff. It's, it's a pretty amazing story. When he was in college, he made an episode of the Muppets with his friends and then sent it in. And next thing he knows, he's interning at the actual place where they make it. Like he was a, he was a Muppet wrangler for Sesame Street. What? Which seems to be like a, a pretty common thing on my on my guests that I've noticed is it's a lot of the whole adage like luck is preparation meets opportunity. And he grew up making these costumes and these props and uh, was very, very passionate about it. And then one day is working for the Henson Company. It's, it's amazing. I mean, we talk about all kinds of stuff uh, in regards to that. Uh, our mutual love of uh, puppets. Um, he, how he got started in restoration. Because he's, he's restored uh, several of the cantina creatures, like the original Muftak, and like later on Ugnaughts and stuff like that. Like the actual ones that were used in the movies, he's restored them. Um, it's so cool. It's so cool, guys. Um, I first heard about Tom from a cantina panel that he did with uh, Lucasfilm Story Group's Pablo Hidalgo at Celebration last year. Um, and it's one of the best panels I've ever been to. If you're really about the details of these movies, you'll really enjoy it. Highly recommend it. Um, but we, we go, we go on, we go on. This is a, this is a really fun show. Um, and it actually ends with a, with a little announcement. Regal Robot has some new products coming up and guys, you are not prepared for ha- like, if you thought the Dubat couch was super cool, which obviously you did, it's amazing. Um, they're t- cranking the cool factor up to eleven with some stuff that they got on. And uh, if you stick it out to the end, maybe there's a, maybe there's a little uh, little discount code, you know? Uh, maybe you'll see, you'll see. But you're guys, Tom is great. This uh, this show is a whole lot of fun. Don't forget to uh, rate on iTunes. And um, yeah, here's a. Without further ado, here's a, the interesting podcast, episode number 43, with Tom Spina. And theme song time. There's, there, there's so there's just so many levels involved to make sure like I so I've got like a USB mic plugged into a laptop and to uh-huh. make sure that the audio is captured from your end and my end into the same file is it's crazy. There's there's probably an easier yeah, that, way to do it. I just don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny too. I mean, I did um I went to school for TV and film. Of course, it was a very long time ago, but you know, the concept of directing audio and you know signals around is not foreign to me so i know you know regardless of what the current technology is i get the struggle yeah (laughs) yeah there there should be leaps and bounds of progress but uh it all boils down to confusing right (laughs) (laughs) oh man but how are you doing i'm good i'm we're uh really hectic uh lately sure um but uh and today was especially one of those days like i just left with this huge list from the studio of like i'm gonna do all these things tonight uh, but yeah oh, it's no. kind of every day now so yeah. it's fine <laughs> yeah that comes with uh when you when you move on up it, it comes yeah. with territory <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> moving on up like I'm George Jefferson or something. Exactly to That's the east a side for old people. I'm gonna. You know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm for it, man. <laughs> All right, nice. I, tr- I, I try to put the theme song to the Jeffersons in every podcast, and uh, nice. we did pretty well right from the top. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's like got it in. Exactly. It's I I, I remember seeing uh it was um during the Seventh Son promo tour, which is a Jeff Bridges movie. It was yeah. like Jeff Bridges and Julianne Moore would play this game where they tried to fit in like a random word into an interview. And they'd oh, be no. like, try to fit the word swordfish in here. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and by the end of the day they just went like swordfish right when they introduced yeah. themselves <laughs> to get it out of the way. <laughs> that's awesome so was, <laughs> i'm gonna start doing that in all my podcast appearances now i'm just gonna have a secret word that i've got to work in and then you, you should know, do like some kind of twitter giveaway if they figure out which word was the secret one out of the thousands and thousands of words that will pour out of my mouth that's <laughs> right that's right <laughs> good luck suckers yeah, yeah. <laughs> game on <laughs> that's amazing. also swordfish so yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes yes perfect are you by the way are we on the air or did we just <laughs> this this, this is literally this? how it is man oh, I, okay cool. I, I have a because i it's a podcast short but i like conversation better i totally yeah. stole the format from chris hardwick and when you uh-huh. tell when you tell people like oh i'd like to interview you i'm like i don't know People get buttoned up, and it's like, oh, uh, here's my answer. I'm like, I'm just going to talk to you for an hour and see what happens. <laughs> you get the uh, you get the better conversation, in my opinion. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, are you are you in New York? I sure am. Is that where – so your office, everything is out of New York? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get a lot of people who are surprised by that, I think, just because of the nature of a lot of the stuff we work with and a lot of the things we do. Yes. Um, but I am, you know, just a New York guy. That's right. Uh, as they say. <laughs> are you from there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I was born and raised on Long Island. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what was that like? Uh, oh, it's like anywhere else these days. I, it's funny. <laughs> the, the, I, it really is so weirdly homogenized. Like if you go anywhere in the country, if you're in any sort of moderate suburban type area, uh, I feel like it's just you, you could be plopped down anywhere and you would just be like, yep, there's the target. Yeah. <laughs> That's the Walmart. And, you know, we're pretty much in the same place. Like I, you know, all the all the foods, the same, et cetera. I, we do have we have the benefit of a lot of really good mom and pop pizza places. And sure. uh, everybody likes the bagels here. But, you know, it, otherwise it's it's the same as anything else. Um, there's buildings. That's that's it, a that's yeah. a common denominator. There's houses. There's <laughs> yeah. lots of people. There is a lot of traffic. It's not unlike L.A. in that regard. Although L.A. has us beat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, winner. You know. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Enjoy that enjoy one. that prize. <laughs> uh, luckily, I get there so much. I get to enjoy that too. So it's nice. There you it's, go. It's, uh, I'm gonna cry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason they have you beat is because I, from what I understand, New Yorkers very seldom have cars to drive. They just well, that's everywhere. when you get into the city. Yeah, no, but the Long Island is is ultimately super suburban. Um, you know, if if you're Brooklyn, really Western Queens, you start to to feel city ish. But really, by the time you get uh, you know uh, a, a handful of miles into the into the island, you're um, you're in suburbia. Uh, you know, maybe it's a little more crowded. Maybe there's a few more cars. Maybe a few more people say, "I'm walking here," but That's otherwise, right. <laughs> it's the same as anywhere else. I should hope that actually happens. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll keep up the mystery. You know, it's like yeah. I, I'd like to. That's that's something I think people like to think happens just all the time. Of and course, so, like sure if, it does. If I go to New York, sure. I'm I'm like stepping into traffic on purpose to try and make right. it happen. Just so you could say it. Then. Yeah. <laughs> The taxi guy rolls his eyes like another tourist. Uh, That's right. Know. He's got the like beaded seat cover. Well, That's in every taxi. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is it's uh, it's and if you are in any apartment in Paris, you can see the Eiffel Tower in the window. Obviously, uh, you know, it's like every movie cliche. Of, <laughs> yeah. And also, the apartments in the city are massive, uh, and yeah, they have anyone can afford them, even young people. So you especially know, that, that's, young people. <laughs> yes. Now, everything Working. you saw in the movies is true. Yeah, I, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> yeah. How did you? Was it like? I mean, obviously there was a super. Wait, wait, cool well, hold on. Wait, where are you from? 
I'm I'm from North Carolina, but I grew up in okay. Florida. All right, and yeah. that, that was like the most New York way to say, "Hey, wait, hold on." Yeah, say, hold on a minute. From? What yeah. are you, you, <laughs> you know? wait from here, I could tell. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sorry, North Carolina, and then you moved to Florida. Correct. I spent like a majority of my life in Florida. Gotcha. So yeah. it's like North Carolina, you were like, "This isn't hot enough." Yeah, I need exactly. More humidity. Could exactly. I, where could I find that? I'm tired of semi sauna. seasons. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, very different. It it was funny because in North Carolina I lived on a farm and then okay. moving to southwest Florida, it's all just beaches and super humidity and tourists everywhere. I'm like right. this is this is very different. <laughs> yeah, that's that is a striking difference, I would imagine. I, yeah, for sure. I, you know, I feel like when you're talking farm, I imagine that's a pretty rural kind of area. Too. Yes. Yeah, it was um, it was a it was a it was an interesting farm. Uh, it wasn't mm-hmm. like a crops farm. It was animals, and we had uh, emus. Okay. Yeah, we had fifty emus, and then we had fifty rias, which are like uh, white emus, and then oh, we wow. had a couple horses, swans, a pony, an ostrich. It was, it was interesting. It's very interesting. That's that's <laughs> really neat. Like I mean, you hear a farm, and it's like okay, cows, chickens, some pigs. That's right. And you're like, Emus, yeah. an ostrich, <laughs> a pony. All right, that's now, right. Know, now we're getting into it. That's yeah, right. Yeah, that's the horses wow. were named after colors. It was silver and blue, because because <laughs> why not? <laughs> and uh, all right then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, life started out interesting. <laughs> yeah, I've had oh. I've had it's tr- what's really weird is emus. If you eat them, you can make like hamburgers. It's so weird. Like, the consistency is like meat. This just got really dark. Yeah. I have, now I'm just picturing you. Uh, it's like, hi, blue. Hi, yeah, exactly. silver. You guys are lucky. We're eating the emus, not you. That's and right. Then, you, know, <laughs> you start laying blue like, eggs, you let us know. <laughs> right. Oh, the emus are just like, oh, why don't you eat the pony? Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know? This is a tragic, tragic story. That's, I, I yeah, it got dark real fast. Expect. You did this. You did this, Tom. Did, this was all me. I should have never asked. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what was I doing? I'm gonna I get an. E- him. I'm gonna get an you email know? from Peter tomorrow, and I'm just gonna forward it to you. <laughs> right. Well, luckily in New York, if you get an email from Peter, it's a guy named Peter. You know? <laughs> it's like, Peter wrote me the other day. He did. All right. You know? right. Like, he Long found Island, another pizza just... place. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they put it on Peter's there. That's right. What? People, no, a pita bread. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be here all day trying to find lunch. <laughs> That's right. Oh. That is amazing. How <laughs> how did you survive the cold wave that just hit? Because in Florida, oh, I was this, dying. <laughs> yeah, the same. Oh, I'm sure you were. Yeah, I, at a, at a brisk awful. 36, I thought I was gonna uh, die. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. What there's double digits. <laughs> I. <laughs> It was uh, oh the same as anything else. You put on an extra layer or two. You bundle up. You race to your car. You race into the studio. Of course. <laughs> Turn of the course. heat a little higher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's very New Yorker of a, you. I, you know, we're in a very fortunate time. Yes. <laughs> like, agreed. There's I, heat. I often, when it hits like that, I think like, wow, people used to have to go outside to go to the bathroom in this. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm just like, how many people just didn't do that? That's, you know? right. and I'm not, I, that's just occurring to me right now because there, I definitely would have had times where I'm like really considering, like, oh yeah, ah, it's not gonna be too bad. Like it's cold out there. Yeah, and I'm picturing, of course, people in like the long john underwear with the flap in the back and everything. Oh, of course, and just you know, like ah, oh, of course, who, who lived like this? But it's... yeah, no, I mean, we're. We're really lucky. We have a lot of ways to, to you know, b- bend yeah. <laughs> temperature to our will. Thank God. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 happy about that. Is what I'm saying. I, I like I like that you have like the New Yorker response. Like you just put your shoulders up. You know, it's fine. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, what do you right. mean? What do you do? How yes. about you? Hey. <laughs> I'm still walking here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't care how cold it is. That's right. What are you doing driving with your heat? I'm standing here. Yeah. Aren't you supposed to be walking? My feet are frozen to the, to the pavement for crying out loud. That's right. What do you um, expect me to do? Sorry, folks. Thanks for tuning in to the Tom and Brian Comedy Hour. Yes, right. absolutely. <laughs> I love this it. This happened. I love it. This, uh, is, this is my show, man. This is exactly uh, how it is. Oh, good. I like it. I have fun. Yeah, um, that, that, is, that is literally my job. 
at the at the end, I'm like, just make sure they have fun at the end, and then then we're good. You don't have to get All anything right. accomplished. Well, we had fun at the beginning. <laughs> I assume the end is just going to be a nightmare. Oh, it's going to uh, be, dude. <laughs> I don't even know where we're going to go from here. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know either. Um, all right, so we've heard where you're from. So tell that's me right. a little more. Wait, no, this is your show. You go yeah. ahead. Uh, yeah, I know, right? That's the that's the the sweet irony of this show is it's me getting to know a bunch of people, but I rarely talk about myself. <laughs> right. I'm the well, vehicle. I have to think the people that listen are curious. I mean, probably. <laughs> I, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it, you notice I'm just. I don't I'm, care. I'm just a good host. We we're not here for Brian. We're here for the right. guests. I'm listening here. Yeah, exactly. All right, I think we've killed that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, it works for me. <laughs> so, are you? So, okay, you're from New York, and mm-hmm. have you obviously done all the touristy things that are in New York, uh, or are you like probably I'm from not. here, so no. <laughs> I've been inside the Empire State Building, but never up it. Okay. I did go to the top of the World Trade Center uh, cool. many years ago. I've not been. Uh, on Liberty Island or, or um, inside the Statue of Liberty, though we've carved a giant replica of Yes, you her. have. Um, that was fun. Um, have you been to Times Square know, for New Year's? I've, no. I feel I've like no never. New Yorker actually does that. No. No. <laughs> Why? Why? No. Um, are you kidding? At my age, I'm lucky I stay awake for New Year's. <laughs> this year, I think my wife was in bed at 8.30, and around oh, like twelve oh one, I looked at the clock and went, "Huh, that counts." And I said, <laughs> it was like, uh, "I'm gonna forget to write that tomorrow." You know? <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> that makes sense. But yeah, I you know, the, it's funny. We still are finding things even on Long Island to do that um, that are slightly touristy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the cool things, if you are ever on Long Island, Teddy Roosevelt's house is really cool. Sagamore Hill. That's real fun. We, we've, uh, everybody here kind of probably went there as a kid in, in grade school. And then, uh, sure. my wife and I went back a few years back and, uh, and that was actually kind of neat to go back and look at through adult eyes. And, and, um, uh, we do, there's a lot of kind of old, uh, of, there's like a Vanderbilt mansion and a few others that are kind of neat to go through sort of a, a, a throwback to a different time. And, um, it's, uh, it's a weird, it's a weird sort of thing to go. Through. Let me go look at someone's old rich person house. Yeah. You know, like this'll be fun. <laughs> um, but it kind of is. And it's kind of, uh, uh, that's, that's something that there's a bunch of on Long Island. Uh, there's a really cool, uh, aquarium further out East in Riverhead that, uh, couple friends of ours got married at a few years ago there were penguins that's cool um, that's yeah that's the best ever yeah um, they like serving got, drinks you know you, the the <laughs> reception was in front of the shark tank what i mean yeah it was awesome as you it do was awesome. as you do um they did serve a fish meal which i thought was odd uh, i think it was a warning Ooh. like you know, bad you taste. guys behave <laughs> yeah exactly you know? they but... just stare the sharks down as they're eating it <laughs> right just like this could be you you know but otherwise um uh you know it was, but yeah that's there there is there is plenty though that uh there's plenty left to do in new york that i don't think we've done sure i mean it's massive so that's fair that's fair. yeah yeah well and that you do have that's another thing i think people don't realize about new york so you know Long Island is it's very big it is long go figure uh, but, <laughs> you don't uh, say <laughs> I do and it uh, but it also it gets very rural out uh, as you go further out east so you know there's parts of Long Island that are like kind of farm country which is kind of neat um huh. and then as you go you go into the city and then you go through Westchester and then you go up into uh northern New York state and it's absolutely massive. Uh, you know, you could drive for eight or ten hours and still not hit the end of it. Sure. And uh, there are, uh, you know, really, you just have to get about an hour away from New York City going to the north. And it's extremely rural. Um, and, I mean, people <laughs> – I and this is not to insult anyone. We used to – my family uh, had a place upstate that we used to go in the summers and, and uh, on vacations in the winter and stuff. Mm-hmm. And – like the people, the local people in the town spoke with a southern accent. Um, really? It was just, yeah, it was like just kind of 
farm people and it was just oh. so well like, like this is still new york right like this is, <laughs> this is where, we went further north to get a southern accent but that's um, so strange you know, it's just just the the kind of cool things about being from a very big diverse state sure sure i when i i went to ireland like two years ago and uh, in that tiny island there's like eight different accents you drive oh you drive four hours and you're like i went from i can understand you to i got nothing Right, not a thing. <laughs> like, You're going to have to write that down, sir. Yeah, <laughs> and nicely, please, because your handwriting is atrocious. <laughs> right. Oh. We did, we, and now, like, even Dublin to Belfast, I think is only like three, uh, three, four hours max, and vastly different accents. It's so strange how wow. colloquial things get as far as speech. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly similar in England. I haven't been there in a while, but I have a bunch of friends, and I was out there, um, I had going through some of Stuart Freeborn's old stuff actually when he retired mm -hmm. and um prop store uh who are some great friends of mine and a great place uh for folks to get real props that were used in movies yes. and things like that um and they were kind enough to have us out for a few days and and uh spend a lot of time with uh people that were uh old friends who we'd never met you know what i mean like sure. we were just we some we'd known each other forever. Some people have just just met then and just became instant friends. And the diversity of accents, even within that, is pretty cool. Um, yeah. But it is, you know, it's weird to us in in the U.S. where it's like you have to go usually pretty far to get that. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and here it's just like you said, an hour or two away, and all of a sudden it's like, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's because they they don't travel very much. They have their villages, and then they learn to speak, and then that's it. And then, right. <laughs> but then you get like places like England where they all come together and you're like, we're all speaking the same language. Right. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like we're not. I, know, like... Tell me about it. <laughs> Especially us uh, Americans. You're like, that's, that's, that's what I mean. Horrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. not a word. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I have friends who've like English was their second language. And I always ask, I'm like, what word do you hate? Like, what's the word that got you? And uh, my one of my friends said the word trunk. I was like, yeah. Huh. He's like, you've got trunk like a like a chest, trunk like a tree trunk, and trunk like an elephant's trunk. And I was like, huh. oh man, and trunks <laughs> like you'd wear like bathing trunks. Yeah, you know, right. Like, like right. Like pants. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> it's like man, English really is the worst. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad. Then I have uh, my I... other friend was a uh, knight, like an armor. He's like, that oh. is spelled knigget. And I uh -huh. don't, I don't like that it's night. <laughs> mm -hmm. So right. strange. It should be something totally different in the first place. And yeah, it shouldn't be spelled that way. <laughs> That's right. None of this makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, what are some? Uh, and this is something I've always wondered. What are some common misconceptions about New York that people tend to have? Oh boy. Because I've, um, I've probably I, already I, said like five. <laughs> oh yeah um i'm hanging up uh, yeah exactly it, most, it's I been fun the biggest one is just that people assume that you know new york city is representative of new york as a whole in terms of the density and population and the no cars and the big buildings and all of that mm -hmm. um and i think just the diversity of the state is is probably the biggest thing that people from outside of new york might not know Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I'm sure a lot of them do, though. I think it's our presumption of their lack of knowledge. I think that's the biggest issue. Oh, wait. No. Um, <laughs> but the, yeah, that's, no, that, that's the name. That would be the one. That's the title of my autobiography. <laughs> right. My presumption of your lack of knowledge. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the Brian Ballant story. <laughs> oh, oh, God. God. You're, you're... Chapter one. Let me tell you. A few that's things. right. Chapter one. I'm walking here. <laughs> oh. I was going to go with Brighton. But that's right. That's fine. Oh, gold. Gold. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, you do a lot of work with props and rebuilding, and I want to start at the beginning. Were you always into oh. movies? Oh, yeah. Me too. Um, so, uh, you know, the or, like 70s, mid 70s, mm -hmm. we're talking. Of course. I'm. Uh, I'm exposed to uh, movies, and it was things like uh, The Wizard of Oz. It was things like King mm -hmm. Kong and Mighty Joe Young, uh, which I will always tell because it's the 
it's so like kind of just silly on my part as a kid, but I was convinced Mighty Joe Young and King Kong were the same movie, just a very long one. Oh, yes. Uh, because the local networks would play them back to back. And I would assu- I'd be like, oh, this movie is going on forever. I really thought that fall off the Empire State Building did him in, but look at him. He's back. You this know? took a turn. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so, the, but that got me. And as a kid, I was immediately fascinated with the making of films um i didn't want to be the the scarecrow or the tin man i wanted to figure out how did they make the scarecrow and the tin man i knew it was make-believe sure and to me that's that made it even more special you know it, it would be one thing if this was just a documentary like all right those guys didn't have to do anything. They just showed up, pointed a camera, and that guy sang about his brain. Right. You know? Um, but no, somebody had to figure out what does a scarecrow look like? How do we make a person look that way? How does he move? What's the costume like? Tin Man, how do we do that? You know, I mean, sure. as a kid, I was just like, how does this happen? Um, and how did the sets get made? And where did this take place? And did they go out and shoot this? Was this in a building? Um, I, you know, how did they get the monkey to stand still like that? Uh, yeah, sure. And you know, so I learned about stop motion, and I learned about um, makeup people, and um, and this is like a really little kid. I was just fascinated with like could I make a mask someday? Like, could I find a way to make a mask that I could wear and make me look like something else? Yeah. Um, and you know, not as any sort of escape. Uh, anybody who looks as good as I look wouldn't want to. No. Um, <laughs> of course, of course. Just, just the <laughs> idea of being able to do that was just, you know, to me, instantly super cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So like just totally, it just connected with you. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, immediately. Um, and I was always, I was a creative kid. I was always drawing. I was always, um, you know, building stuff. If I didn't have a toy that I wanted, I would try and build it out of, you know, blocks or Legos or um, cardboard and paper, whatever. Um, you know, there was a lot of, we would always save those. <laughs> so, you know, you'd get a, a, a shirt for Christmas mm-hmm. and it comes in that like Sears box. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, that like thin cardboard. Mm-hmm. I used to love that cardboard. And it was like, <laughs> if I got a shirt, everybody else was disappointed. I was like, yeah, a box. <laughs> you know, this is going in my collection. And, <laughs> you know, you don't the, see it. Would... You don't see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like, that's going to be a Stormtrooper's left thigh. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I'm going to stain it up. It's a Sand Trooper. That's right. You know? That's right. <laughs> and they're like, what's wrong with you? Exactly. You just hug it and you're like, you'll see one day. Yeah. One exactly. day. <laughs> That's amazing. So did yeah. you take art classes growing up or you just like learned by doing this stuff? Um, I, I learned by doing things wrong. Of course. Um, I call it error and trial. That's right. <laughs> um, and I really do. Because that's, I, I, you know, if there's any people always ask for advice and stuff like the, the best advice is just keep on doing things and, you know, just do it, and if it's wrong, that's fine. Just do it again and figure something out because you did it wrong. Right. Um, and no, wrong. And then <laughs> uh, you, uh, the yeah. So I mean, I did a lot. Was just on my own. A lot was just figuring stuff out and just having a very curious nature. And having a father who was a little bit mechanical, although not necessarily artistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, he could fix cars and he could fix houses and things like that. Um, he cool. knew a little bit about everything in terms of, um, uh, you know, all, anything in a house, plumbing, electricity, uh, carpentry, all of that. And some he knew a lot about, but some, but. He was uh, he's very well-rounded and has um, a pretty good depth of, of knowledge on that sort of stuff. And so, you know, we'd figure ways to apply that to whatever I was making. Right, um, right. And it was always a, a garage full of uh, hammers and, and screwdrivers and things like that. Lots of all sorts of nails. Um, it was never uh, we never had hot glue guns or Dremels or anything like that growing up. So I. It was always a struggle. It was a lot of tape and staples. I used staples a lot. Oh, sweet. Um, I used to take, um, I would take paper bags and I would do, 
I would I would pattern them. I didn't know that that's what I was doing, but I would dart them. If you really? know what a dart is when you cut a pattern on mm-hmm. something. Uh, it's where you cut like a little triangle or, or a curved shape out to make the car, the cardboard or uh, paper curve to a form that you want. Right. Um, and I would, I would basically be doing kind of a drape and dart method. I would just take a flat piece of paper or a paper bag and I would, I would just dart it and bend it and overlap things and staple things until it started to look like whatever it was I was trying to make at the time. Um, but I did take a lot of art classes. Going back to the actual question. So, um, <laughs> is that what I, it was? Yeah. I, beats me. <laughs> I don't really listen to you. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, and you know, certainly through, uh, through grade school, that was, you know, everybody takes art, but that was like, you know, the, the highlight of my day. Sure. <laughs> um, and uh, always connected with the art teachers when I got into uh, junior high and high school. That's when I really loaded up on any art classes I could take, any TV uh, type classes I take, although there weren't a lot of those in uh, my high school. Um, I, I would mostly take um, art classes that I, I would always try to steer what I was doing to apply to you know, the idea of making something that could be used in a movie, either a costume right. or a mask or a prop of some kind. Um, and then in addition to the usual sculpting, painting, drawing, all of that stuff, computer graphics, oddly enough, if you had asked me in 1989 mm-hmm. uh, or 1990 what I thought I would, you know, what I really wanted to do, I really wanted to go into uh, 3D computer graphics and doing computer effects for films, right. uh, which is really weird uh, <laughs> considering everything I loved was practical effects and everything I love now is practical effects. And uh, But at the time, it was this dreamlike cutting edge sort of thing to be able to make something realistic that only existed virtually. And the... I, I actually saw computers as a really neat way for me to do 2D animation because I always wanted to make cartoons and stuff. Right. And with a computer, you could do – oh, there's a program called D-Paint that we used to use on the Amiga mm-hmm. that you could do um, you know, 10 or 12 frame a second animations with in 2D. Oh, right. Uh, and you could get like 64 colors. It was amazing. Whoa. Um, That's the yeah, big crayon box. Thank you. Um <laughs> So, uh, so there was that, but then, you know, you had this burgeoning 3d field and things like the idea of doing blue screens by using a computer, because I couldn't do optical printing, but I'm starting to find out like, okay, there's some video equipment here that you can run through, uh, you know, an Amiga toaster and actually do a blue screen. And that was really fascinating to me. Um, at the time I was doing a lot of puppet work too. So I was building puppets and characters. Uh, I'll, I'll go way back to the seventies again. Yeah. You know, if it wasn't mighty Joe young, if it wasn't King Kong or star Wars eventually, but it was the Muppet show oh, that yes. was another, like I could not get enough of it. The, and again, it was this idea that this was being created that, uh, especially in the Muppets, because you have this, none of this exists. If you have, uh, 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 you write an episode and there's, you know, um, eight pigs that are dancers, you have to make the pigs. You can't just call an agency. Right. They're like, <laughs> we need eight Muppet pigs and they got to dance and you get them in, you know. But I know like, a guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, that and, and that to me was really neat that, that there are these people making this wacky show and they're making everything, the sets, the costumes, the puppets, like everything doesn't exist until someone makes it. Yeah. Um, so I then started to see the computer stuff as a tool to do basically, and a, a lot of this was nothing um, groundbreaking, but as a way to get uh, the, the capabilities that were normally only reserved for a high-end studio or something like that, or someone in film doing a lot of processing and, and um, that sort of thing. So the idea that we could do a Luma key or a mm-hmm. Chroma key um, was really cool to me because yeah. I could set up a room in the house with a blue screen and puppets and we could be anywhere. Uh, whereas, 
we you know if we had to make sets all the time this would take forever oh yeah um and uh and it was neat it gave us a lot of room to play and it ultimately um you know the computer technology on the home level wasn't it was frustratingly you know off the mark from where it needed to be to do the stuff i wanted to do in my head right um you know, and then like things like Terminator do come out and oh, I'm yeah. like, you know, I want to morph something. This is amazing. <laughs> um, and that was always just out of reach. There were a few two dimensional morph programs that you could get for an Amiga. And we, I, I would mess around with that and stuff like that. And it was, it was fun and it was cool to, to morph an image to another image after, you know, setting it up, walking away for a few days and coming back to see it rendered. Yeah. Um, but the technology, you know, we were dealing with computers that literally had one megabyte of RAM, a megabyte, <laughs> you know, it's like our phones have thousands and thousands of times that yeah, um, and this a is picture big... on your phone is multiple. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, that's that's where the technology was. And it was just it was clear that that wasn't going to be something uh, that was going to be viable in the time I wanted. So I focused on TV and I continued um to work on uh puppets and masks and monsters and you know the puppet thing eventually got me uh an internship at sesame street dude who's your favorite muppet oh uh so i asked the hard i I asked the hard questions here swedish chef is my knee jerk if you gotta ask like it's just boom swedish chef um good good rolf rolf is a close second good because he's just so authentic um and you know, as much as everybody says Kermit is, you know, Jim's alter ego, mm-hmm. um, I think there's something to be said for Rolf's sensibility possibly being, you know, the most Jim Henson like. Oh, um, okay. There is there's a purity to to that to that brown dog. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I always liked uh, it was it was a tie between Gonzo and uh, uh, Pepe. Oh, nice. Pepe made me laugh. <laughs> Pepe, Pepe does make me laugh. He didn't come on till you know much later. Yeah, it was one me. of the newer so ones. Yeah, but he out of all the new ones, he's by far the best. He's oh, yeah. such great <laughs> delivery. So good. Yeah, Bill Beretta with that. He's so good. Uh, so did you did you work with Jim Henson? You did. N- no, you did I not. wish I had. He Man. he passed away just a a, a year or two before. Ah. This, probably three years before I got my internship. Gotcha. Um, so you worked with his Richard son. Hunt had just died uh, as well. Oh, man. Um, so Richard was, uh, for people that don't know, he was Statler and Beaker. Yep. Um, he was <laughs> uh, Forgetful Jones on uh, Sesame Street and a number of other characters, Gladys the Cow. Um, he was the one of the originators of Miss Piggy because he and Frank actually shared the role for a while. Right. Um, and, and, uh, by all accounts, was also the energetic sort of epicenter of a lot of Muppet mayhem. Um, he was he was well loved, and just being there, you could still sense. Um, I don't not to be morose or anything like that. Sure, but, uh, there was a definite sense of loss uh, of for both Jim and um, and he. Then it was. Uh, it was an interesting time. Um, Brian Henson was there. At, he wasn't often at Sesame. In fact, I only remember him being there once or twice. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked most closely with uh, Ed Christie, who was the head of the Muppet Workshop at the time. Cool. Um, and uh, he was he was really cool. He, you know, I owe him a lot just for giving me a chance. I came in with a uh, really crappy. Uh, magnetic album, you know, with the sticky pages yeah. full of terrible Polaroids <laughs> of these Muppet replicas that I had made. Um, the the whole thing basically came out of in college. My friends and I thought, like, well, why don't we like just make an episode of the Muppet Show, like our own though, like not what? remake anything that's been made, and. You know, so we just kind of hold a bunch of stuff together. I built a ton of puppets. We built sets. We did some blue screen. We did what? Uh, 
this whole range of stuff and and just for fun, you know, and we did it. And I think, you know, we probably had it in the, the TV festival at the school or whatever. But w- when we finished it, I said, you know, like I owe these Henson people so much. They've given us so much inspiration, all of us. Let's I'm going to just send it to them and just be like, hey, this is you know, we did this just because we love what you do- you've you done. And, and thank you. Yeah. Um, and that. Uh, got me a call you know that someone Dude. saw it and i didn't expect anything out of that you know? right well it's a good and resume to have be like hey that I, thing you're doing i just did it too <laughs> yeah but i guess i you know it's pretty so, good uh, i got i got the uh, call and then i um i went down and and got to tour their their offices which were amazing um Dude. and um and and was introduced to people as a puppeteer, which was really oh. a moment, uh, sure. you know, to, to look back on, to be like, you know, uh, like, oh, this is Tom Spina. He's a puppeteer. And then we would just keep going. And I'm like, I, wait, I am. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I puppeteer things. So I guess I am a puppeteer now. Like, that's a thing. Wow. Um, you know, or, or uh, it's like, oh, you're a builder. You should go see the workshop. Yes, I should see the workshop. <laughs> that's a great idea. <laughs> You're so right. a few weeks later, I think I went back and met um, met Ed at the workshop and um, and just kind of showed him the stuff. And I said, do you guys ever offer internships or anything? Is there uh, any, you know, there's a there's a spot on Sesame Street. We need a, the puppet wranglers assistant. What? Um, yes. And it is exactly, you know, as cool as that sounds, which I don't know how cool that sounds, but to <laughs> sound, me, it, it sounds, sounds like amazing. the puppets are real and they try to run and you're the guy's like, nope, 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 <laughs> your scene's not over yet. Get back over there, Grover. <laughs> that's kind of what it's like. <laughs> it's really not that far off. Um, <laughs> that, but, I, uh, that was my next question. What goes into being an intern for Sesame Street? Um, you have to get up early and fight a lot of traffic to get to Kaufman Astoria Studios, which they had just moved to the year I started there. Um, Ruth Buzzy was uh, a regular on the show that year. Um, Maya Angelou was down. Hillary Clinton came on the show once. Um, it was, it was, uh, John Goodman was there, Marissa Tomei. It was what? really cool. It was really cool. And of course, you know, those were like the stars everyone else knew. And I'm like going, that's Ernie. I, know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would Bieber, expect nothing less. You know, it's just like, that's, yeah. this is amazing. Oh my God. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that it, it's, it's one of these things where, uh, you would get there early. You would be there a little before the performers would would come to stage uh they were really cool in that they set us uh our green room was the same as the performers green room what uh, it's called it the muppet room and you would just kind of like you got to just hang out with um you know whoever was performing that day so whether it was uh kevin clash was there a lot uh jerry nelson was there all the time he was Dude. amazing um amazing guy so much history frank uh oz would be down sometimes um, Peter Linz, who's who's doing a lot of great stuff, uh, you know, for for all of the years now. Back then, he, he and uh, Noel McNeil were like the two kind of utility guys who would be hanging out and doing the extras. Uh, Joey Mazzarino and um, oh, why can't I think of his name? Uh, David Rudman, mm. uh, who also does a lot of uh, characters now. Um, David and Joey were also sort of utility guys doing all kinds of off characters and they had Joey and Davey monkey who were hysterical. <laughs> I um, should hope so. <laughs> but, uh, but it was all really funny people that were, um, all connected to what they were doing. An entire family of people in the production that were there for some of them for decades, some from the beginning. Sure. Um, and all doing a creative thing for a living, uh, which was the, best possible thing i could have been exposed to dude that must i i'm convinced that muppets are magic because to think you it's it's somebody's hand in basically felt with eyes and Mm -hmm. and i mean even when you're an adult you're looking at a muppet you'll talk to the muppet you'll be like oh my god it's so great to meet you (laughs) talk to the muppet yeah no it's true that's exactly what you do right it's absolutely true um they are they they are magnetic yeah, I remember, I watched um uh at somebody you know, Adam Savage. He uh, I've heard of that fellow. Yeah, you know, that guy who busts yeah. myths or whatever. He, Something like that. He did a he did an episode of Tested where he went and made a Muppet. 
Oh and yeah, with Rick Lyon, who's yes, an old friend. Yes, yes, amazing. And and he puts on the puppet and he just like starts talking. He's, Do you want it to have hair and whatever? And I stopped yeah. looking at the people and started looking at the Muppet. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. And yeah, then I, I went down really the is. I went down the Etsy rabbit hole. I was like, I need a puppet now. <laughs> <laughs> Where can I get a puppet? Yeah, my fiance's like, what are you gonna do with it? I was like, be friends with it, obviously. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> what else are you gonna do with a Muppet? <laughs> Thank you. God. <laughs> uh, that's too funny. Yeah, no, Rick Rick was uh someone that was sort of in the, the I guess they um I don't know what you would call it. I, I kind of want to say in the system, but that's not the right word. But right. there were a batch of sort of puppeteers that were all um going to workshops at the same time. So, you know, Henson would do these workshops and they would invite in invite in you know, some of the bigger ones would, would get 20 people in there and they would kind of filter through and then there'd be another one and they'd invite 10 people mm -hmm. uh, and then another one and maybe there's eight and they would just, you know, workshop you. They'd run you through some st different stuff. You'd make up scenes, you'd improvise. And um, Rick was at uh, uh, some of those. David Feldman was at some of those. He he went on to be the mayor of Lazy Town, if anyone's ever what? seen that show. Um, the uh eric jacobson was always in those and he's now miss piggy and fozzy bear and um sam yes. eagle all of frank oz's characters mm -hmm. um the uh, john tartaglia was there who's done all kinds of stuff but most notably he was the uh lead in avenue q when that came on broadway yeah um and Rick Lyon built all the puppets for that. Um, wow. So, yeah, there was all of these these great performers there. Uh, Victor Yared was in there. He's done all kinds of stuff. Um, Tyler Bunch, he's also – he's on Sesame Street still and, uh, and a super, super nice fella. He did a bunch of things uh, with us even. Uh, we did some stuff. Uh, like just, you know – random like we would meet these performers and we'd all get to know each other and just be like, hey i'm gonna shoot a puppet thing do you want to do puppets sure you know like of course i do God. right i'm amazed by any of that I've... puppets are my friend that's right <laughs> i only have puppet friends is that weird is that uh, <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna say no yeah exactly, it's your show, yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> as long as it's on tv it's uh it's accepted <laughs> right yeah yeah so while you're there being a pa did you like uh, did you glean all the skills on like how to puppet efficiently, like how to use your hand oh, and stuff like that? Oh, that totally, totally happens. You you Dude. absorb all sorts of of stuff, and they, you know, the workshops they teach you a lot too. Uh, Jane Henson actually was uh, led a few of the workshops, and those were really? when it were when it would be a bigger workshop. It would be Jane, uh, sometimes Marty Robinson, who plays Telly and Snuffy um, and and other characters, and his just a hysterical human being. Mm -hmm. uh, but those, you know, where there were more people, they were usually geared towards instruction. Uh -huh. And where there were fewer people, it was geared towards being more of a workshop, doing more improvising and, and right. performance. Um, you know, but uh, it was always kind of neat. You would, I, anytime I, I watch any performance, you know, there's always something you can learn from it. It's like any piece of art, any piece of sculpture, I see someone that's created a, a, a creature, a character, a mask, or a wax figure, you know, you know hyper-realistic or inspired. There's any piece of art I look at, and there's always something that I'm taking away from it. Um, it's just, like I said, I have a curious nature. I think that's one of the things I like about Adam so much, Adam Savage. Yeah. That, um, that and name dropping. No, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but no, he, hey, I know, did it first. You're in the clear. When, when people ask me about him, I'm like, he is as curious as he seems on screen. And to me, that's the most amazing thing, that he has maintained this insane level of curiosity. And I think that's just the coolest thing ever. Absolutely. So going from Muppets, when did you make – when did you start doing, like, uh, masks in that sort of medium? Because that's – felt in, in that, it's very, very different than, like, rubber it, and latex. It and... was strangely side by side. So at the same time that I'm learning to make Muppets in my basement, mm -hmm. um, I also had a full little, like, effect shop built up that I had made where Sweet. I was reading Tom Savini's uh, Grand Illusions, book one, because I couldn't find book two. I didn't even know <laughs> if it was out yet. But um, And learning about making foam appliances and making blood and gore and guts and chopped off arms and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, 
you know, I was reading his book and trying to figure out um, how, how to make masks. And I had made I made a kind of crappy werewolf because I'm, I'm obsessed with werewolves. I think they're the best of the Sweet. monsters. Um, I made a vampire with half his face torn off, if I recall. What? Um, I eventually did a, a pretty, pretty nice version of the Leatherface mask from Texas Chainsaw 2. Oh, right um, but that that also introduced me to the idea of if you don't release your mold before you put the foam in, Uh-oh. it locks the mold together forever. <laughs> um, and then I learned about throwing molds away. That of was course. Fun. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, learned by it's doing <laughs> error and trial, folks. Um, but yeah, you know. And then um, oh gosh, the '89 Batman came out. I thought that was the coolest suit ever. Um, I made a, a sculpture of that mask in clay that I got at like a KB toys, you know, like Sweet. kind of weird colored clay of and, course. uh, learned about doing, you know, more slip latex castings and stuff like that. Um, still using plaster of Paris for the molds. Cause that's all the local hardware store had. Oh, of course. Um, didn't, didn't really, you just started to get into the idea of, you know, ordering from these places I'd see in catalogs, mm-hmm. um, Oh gosh, was it Gore Zone or Gore Zone? It might have been the magazine, and then it's like Gore Galore or something. Was one of these companies you could order like fake blood from and foam, two part poly foam, and uh, a there was a, a oh was it the Cryoland cold foam that they used to make? I don't know if this is um, I don't know if it was them making it in the eighties. I assume so, but they had what was billed as a cold foam latex. It was uh-huh. really just a really soft poly foam, but um, I would get that because I wasn't allowed to bake foam latex in the oven at home. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, so I would have to make do with poly foam. Um, but it was neat. And it teaches, you know, that sort of thing teaches you to improvise. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> what, what can I make with what I've got? That's, That's sure. number one thing I look for when I'm when I'm hiring folks. You know, it really is about like, you know, what, how good are you with what's around? Sure. Um, because that's someone that's going to, that's going to improvise their way to being a great <laughs> worker, a great artist. Um, yeah. I'm always impressed with that sort of skill. That makes sense. You can like, when you're, when you're about to hire someone, you can walk in with a cigar and be like, when I made this, I had staples and, and <laughs> shirt boxes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that I, I am known to occasionally ask that sort of like, that's right. <laughs> Like when before you were even born, I made such and such. That's right. Um, Don't talk to me terrible, until you've but... made a stormtrooper left thigh out of cardboard boxes. Right. <laughs> I did just get reminded. I was, I was talking with um, Steve Richter, who helped me make uh, the, uh, who really did most of the work on the Adam Savage Chewbacca mask that we made, which was amazing. Um, but um, he, I was talking to him about the mechanisms on that and realizing, like. You know, this all traces back to uh, the making of a saga that was the uh, long documentary that came out when Re- uh, Return of the Jedi was out. And mm-hmm. I recorded it off Channel 21 PBS out here in New York. Oh, sweet. And uh, would fast forward through the breaks where they would try and sell you the tote bag for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but I saw them using cable controls to mechanize the snout on a Gamorrean guard. And uh. that turned into me as a kid figuring out that if I ran a string through something and it pulled on something else and I attached that to the skin, I could make it look like its nose was breathing or whatever. Right. Um, I didn't know the part where it needs to run through a cable so that it doesn't pull the mask off your head every time <laughs> you yank the string. Um, but I would hold it in place and someone would pull the cable and it would, you know, the nose would breathe. And <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's um, awesome. But you... and I, if only all of this occurred now, I would have thousands of photos and video on my phone of it. Right. But instead, I've got maybe a sad handful of Polaroids. That that's right. I all I have really... left are scars. <laughs> that's right. Yes. That's, that's when I first got the hot glue gun. That's you right. Yeah. <laughs> that's I'm... an exacto. You know? I'm down to eight digits. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh man! So, do you have do you have a favorite uh, material you like to work with? Because you're, I oh. mean, you work with everything, but you have one where you're like, "Sweet, this is my jam." I, I love wet clay. 
Um, yeah. That's, it's a clay that was developed for the Disney parks. Mm -hmm. uh, Wed Walter Elias Disney, as they say. Uh -huh. um, and they say it because it was his name. But anyway. Uh -huh. That um, makes sense. It checks out. I, it's, so I, I, I'm i not going to name drop. I had a, a conversation with you a can. Effects, You can. You can. Uh, all right. It was John Berg who oh, um, sweet. worked on uh, Star Wars movies and so many others, but uh, was – you know, a, a hero of mine for his work on the cantina scene yes. and uh, on things like the ad ads for empire, which are genius. Uh, he also happens to be just one of the sweetest people in the world. Yes. Uh, but we were talking about wed clay and what we kind of came down to uh, was this idea, like it is a clay that grows with you as you sculpt it. So it starts off mushy when you need it to be mushy and you can slap a bunch of clay up and build up real fast. Uh -huh. And then it starts to firm up a little bit as you work and it dries out and you can start to make proper forms. And then it gets real dry as you've been going for a while and you can start to carve in your detail. And it just, it ages in this beautiful way as you're working with it. Um, and it's, I, I love that it's water-based. I love that you can, dry it a bit and make it a little firmer. You can wet it a bit and make it mushier. And, um, it's, you know, as long as you're not, um, as long as you don't over wet it and turn it into mud, you're in, you're, you're in for a treat. I, it, it works so beautifully and fast and cleans up so well, and it doesn't stink. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I grew up on sulfur based oil clays, of course, which, were just smelled terrible and it was just you know whatever i could get at the art store when i ran out of the kb toys purple clay yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. hey you gotta do what you gotta do Got, um you gotta do yeah, what you gotta I had do a giant bucket of of i cleaned out a store uh, a local art store of chavant clay once it was pretty sure it was chavant um so Shavant aroma. I, it was a sulfur-based clay. It was this terrible terracotta brown sulfur-based <laughs> clay that stunk. Um, and I got all that they had, and they never restocked. And I always wanted to do more sculpting, and I then you'd reuse the clay all the time. I was just like, I need more of this clay. And they're like, Oh well, we'll probably be coming in soon. I'm like, I bought this three years ago. <laughs> you know, like the shelf is still empty. That's right. um, <laughs> That's These what, are the struggles. There were, I couldn't go online and order it. <laughs> sure. Hey, sometimes that doesn't help. <laughs> no, that's true. That's I, true. I, and I remember in high school, I ordered a hat. It was like a, it was like a hat for a costume, and it was uh -huh. from China. And it took so long to get here, I forgot that I'd order it. <laughs> so like, I it's got, a surprise hat. Yeah, I was like, I got mail. What is this? Oh, <laughs> hey, surprise! There's, yeah, the, there's that. Huh. That's fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Surprised Maybe myself. Maybe next Halloween. You know? That's that's right. That's right. <laughs> so I I actually uh, went to your celebration panel this year. You did. It was amazing. Because so was this the Cantina one? Yes. Or the... Okay. That, cool. That is the one. Because I am. That is my my that... Star Wars fandom is very detail oriented. Like I am. Uh -huh. I am in it. And to have <laughs> you there and Pablo, I was like, this is this is the greatest panel I've ever been to. So That's very kind of you to say, well, dude, you did a lot of work. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you. It is a ton of work. Anybody who's been, um, it is many, many, many hours of work going to each of those presentations and just a lifetime of it went in, you know, on Pablo and my, sure. uh, it shows, all of that. <laughs> it shows. Yeah. So none of that is put on. None of that is forced huh? oh yeah <laughs> it is that level of geekery is completely natural i love it i feel at home very well done thank you <laughs> that's what we that's what we strive for so is, is the was the cantina when you first saw it like love it for sight this is oh, this is your jam as i saw it first actually in the um the storybook uh, yeah, because yeah, I yeah. couldn't convince my mom to take me to the movie, even though the commercial said it was at a theater near us. Oh. Um, <laughs> and they, to this day, my mom tells me, you would say it was at a theater near you. And I'm like, yeah, mom, I know. You know? <laughs> but it's cute. She remembers. Yeah, but that, was, <laughs> that counts. You know, so before I got to see the movie, I had the storybook and there's a two page spread. And those the Duros, the two blue yes. goggle eyed guys are staring into your soul. <laughs> um they scared me. I would like, you know, I'd look at them through my fingers and I, I would turn the page real quick sometimes, but I would always go back and Muff Tack was there. The Cantina yes. band was there. And I, I just, 
instantly fell in love with all of that. And uh, to see the movie, I, you know, I wanted to know more. I wanted to see the rest of these guys. I knew I wasn't getting all of them on, you know, in the background. I could see there were other shapes. You know, who's that guy? What's going on there? Right. Um, but it would be years before I had a VHS. Um, uh -huh. You know, we're talking, oh gosh, 80 four or 85 maybe before I got a VHS of star Wars. Really? We were a little late to that. Um, and you know, it's hard to imagine that now I think for people like the movie comes out six months later, you can analyze the heck out of it. Yeah. You um, waited eight years. <laughs> yeah. I remember building a proton pack as a kid. What? And the, the, uh, the way that I did it. So in the, in the sort of uh, the montage sequence in Ghostbusters, mm -hmm. there's a, a, a cover from Omni magazine with a proton pack on it. And it goes by sort of sideways on the screen. And I would just pause my tape at that moment. And then the pause only lasted for like four minutes. So it didn't burn the tape out or the heads or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would sketch furiously and then like, it would come off pause and I'm like, Oh no. And then I'd like go rewind and then try and pause it. And I'd miss it. And I'd try again and I pause it and then I finally get it. And then I'd be like, Oh, sketch, 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 sketch. Yeah. Quick, you know? quick. And, <laughs> and then I would go to the hardware store and I would just look for parts or the junk stores or the, you know, like Newberry was one of those like sort of cheap. It wasn't a dollar store at all. It was like a little department a store thing, but it was always cheap enough that I could, you know, get some cheap pots or pans or something incorporated into the builds. And, right. um, yeah, and it would just be whatever I had saved. There were model train parts. There were um, parts from toys. Uh, it, it really was like whatever. I, I didn't like to throw away things. I would take them apart and see what was inside of them. Yeah. And say like, well, that looks sci-fi-ish. I should save that. There's the day comes. I might need that. Yeah. If, you never know. <laughs> That's right. Repurpose um, so, it. You know, eventually I would get that closer look at that cantina scene, and uh, and I and I got to know the Jabba's palace scene from that uh, Return of the Jedi documentary. Yes, and you know now I'm I'm able to pause this this scene and look and really start to go like, okay, before the the anvil headed guy comes up, there's like three or four guys in that booth. There's the right. guy with the red eyes who we see later, the bat demon thing. Mm -hmm. There's there's that guy with the horn on his head. And I think that's a brain, you know, like yeah, that exactly. kind of thing. <laughs> sure. Um, is, it, is, that a, but, is that a metal top knot or is that a flashlight? What is going on right, there? <laughs> uh, how great is that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I love that I never spotted the, the, the flashlight. Uh, right? you know, I love that Pablo saw that. And then I came with the picks from, I think it was Doug Beswick gave them to us, but they were Tippett's picks. And it was just like, you know. Look at that. They jammed a flashlight in his head. Yeah. That's awesome. And then he's like, that's what that is. You know? <laughs> like, I love that sort of discovery. Yeah. Um, I didn't know until I went to your panel. I was like, what? It's, <laughs> you can look at that scene for decades and not know everything. And not and, and we still have stuff we're trying to figure out. And I love it. I Same. love that. I Same. love that level of... I, it's to me, it's right on par with, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Haunted Mansion, these things that you could ride forever and never pull all of it out. Sure. Um, it will always say something new to you. It will always drag you in. And uh, that it's just the coolest thing ever. That's why, I mean, it's as much work as it is. That's why we do it. We absolutely love it. And I'm, I, I am thrilled that it connects with people. I didn't know it would. Oh, like, yeah. We, it is. We packed. did the first one. And it, uh, yeah, you know, and we did the first one. We're like, all right, this will be pretty cool. Like, and and then you know, John Berg came on for the first one, and I got to know Doug and uh, and and Phil a little bit, and we got to talk about you know these things with them and get all their stories. And then I got to know Rick and Nick Maley and Stuart and Kay, um, and got to pull all these stories out. And then it's just like, man, I hope people come because this stuff is really cool. Yeah. Um, and then they did, and I was just like, "All right." <laughs> I, I love your 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 commentary over like them hanging out in the backyard and like, and there's Phil Tippett being super happy, like he always is. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, just, oh, he's like the grumpy uncle in the effects industry. I know. He still is. He's he, awesome. Though. He's what is genius? He, he's too talented. So it's got to it's got to counterbalance some way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
it's like, well, we we got. Uh, hey, boss, we got this big bucket of talent and this little jar of happy. That's all that's left over. All right, just put it in Phil Tippett. Call yeah. it a day. We're going home. You know? That'll work. Uh, and then you just get, yeah, I made a rancor. Cool, right. yeah, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah, kind of cool. Yeah, right. I mean, if you're into yeah, that kind of stuff, I don't know. I threw it away. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's absolutely amazing. I actually was very fortunate to be at his shop just a few weeks ago for a bit. And, oh, it's uh, amazing. And he was around making uh, Mad God, which if you if you haven't look up Mad God, uh-huh. uh, it's this passion project of his that's gone on for years. And he did a Kickstarter recently, and it's just twisted and bizarre and gross and uh, amazing. And it's a stop motion epic of weirdness um, <laughs> i would expect nothing less <laughs> you really i don't know that you can expect any of it yeah, exactly. it really it's it's surprising it's awesome though. it's like uh, it's, it's not right but in like the best way possible <laughs> right or the worst it's yeah. one of the two it has to be it has to be there's no other there's no other way you can go about it with phil tippett <laughs> Phil, yeah. just think Phil Tippett's passion project. That's that in and of itself right. explains yep. everything. <laughs> it really does. No, he's, he's I, he and he remains just a genius. That's amazing. So, it, it, am I correct to assume, given your love of werewolves, that the wolf guy is your favorite cantina monster? <laughs> oh, you know what? Strangely enough, no. Oh, <laughs> is it the band member? Uh, I it it would it usually. So funny enough, and I never realized it till right now, but it probably goes down to them all being on the same page or at least in that same spread. Yeah. But it's probably between Muttak, the band, and the Duros. Fair, um, fair. The, the band probably ekes everybody out. That's fair. I mean, um, they outnumber them, so. <laughs> that's true. Uh, but Muttak is, is really special, and, and, you know. Especially for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know him fairly well. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, and and you know, even the even the Duros and the and the band guy, you know, we we've gotten to, um, you know, years ago there was a I had gotten a casting of an original Duros head that was really cool, and eventually what? I did get one of the screen used masks and pair of hands for my collection, which was just bizarre Dude. to have it before you, you know, uh, like. This this shouldn't be here. This is amazing. Um, and I was very fortunate to get one of the band members. Um, Dude, and the that was one of the most amazing things in my life. Was that that was one of the first um, of those uh, of the Rick Baker's characters that that I managed to actually get. I got to see one of the band members at Disney. Uh, at MGM Studios, back in the late 80s, early 90s, they had a prop display in what became Pizza Planet and what's now Pizza what? Rizzo. Um, <laughs> I'm pizza in here. That's right. <laughs> uh, and that was just this brick building that they had a prop display in for a while. And there was – you would walk in and there was uh, train cars from – Rather, there were mine cars from Temple of Doom, and there were animals from the train cars from um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, mm-hmm. um, and there were some Star Wars pieces. There was a, there was a batch of Death Star tiles on one of the walls. Sweet. There were a pair of speeder bikes, but it really was turning around and being face to face with a Cantina band member that was a shocking moment and a clear, clear influence uh, in the direction of my life. Sure. Um, and it struck me so much that I took one of my 24 photos for that whole one week <laughs> trip. Um, because that's all we had, whatever was on the roll. Of course, um, of course. And I did snap a photo of that band member. Uh, and it's a little washed out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but you held it, it to is, the sky, said, I will own this. Sh- yeah, it is a cherished photo, and it's it's um, and it's really cool to to be able to sort of sit in front of the real thing and look at it. And we got to make one for Sideshow. Uh, Sideshow yeah. Collectibles did a life size band member. I got to sculpt that with my friend Brian Lewis, uh, which that was back when my our studio was in the house, <laughs> and yeah, wow. um, I had converted a, a room in my home to to be the studio. And Brian and I sat in there for a week and sculpted a band guy. Um, Dude. And then it was an official Star Wars product, and that was wild. 
Um, do you, really cool. You realize that's like that's stuff dreams are made of to be like a fan growing up of the specific thing and then actually owning that thing and then working on that thing. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I, I can't even, I don't know that I could count the fortunate moments in my life. I, and I mean that in, this isn't any sort of a humble brag or anything. It's pure, uh, dude, dumbfounded humility on my part. I am, uh, I'm so lucky. And I, I can, I could just rattle off these moments of, you know, I got to do what? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, they, I mean, there's that old saying, you know, luck is preparation meets opportunity. It's like you had yeah. all this work leading up to, and you like developed these skills. And then when the opportunity presented itself, you were ready. That's yeah, there, dude. There, yeah, there's a, there's something to be said for being present and, and available for things. I mean, um, you it's, know, it's, I, I learned how to sculpt making cantina monsters. Then, you know, beautiful. Volkswagen needs cantina monsters for a commercial, but the time isn't there and they can't use the old ones because they're too fragile or not in the archives as they discovered. And mm -hmm. Someone like Pablo, who I just met because we both loved things in the background of Star Wars. Yeah. You know, and Steve Sands, we tell him, uh, you oh, know yeah. what? You need someone like Tom Spina. Uh, what? <laughs> Dude. Um, then, and, uh, wow. 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 You know, and that, and and prior to that, to to have grown up loving werewolves and American Werewolf in particular, and to get to know Bob Burns, who also is a keeper of many cantina monsters, as well as yeah. amazing artifacts of all sorts of movies, anywhere from George Powell's uh, stuff through everything Rick Baker ever did and uh, Chris Wayless stuff and, you know, gremlins and, uh, uh, Oh gosh, Glenn Strange's original Frankenstein boots from the forties. Um, the, uh, Herman Munster's headpiece, the Wolfman came from, uh, the, the original Lon Chaney Wolfman, uh, monster masks from all kinds of movies, real masks used in the movies. And, uh, and on top of it, just the sweetest, uh, most generous man uh, and his wife, Kathy, uh, both of them, huge influences on me that have done so much to uh, help me along and to connect me with people and to and to make some of those opportunities happen and to, to help me to be available for them. And to I remember going yeah. in before meeting Sideshow for that first band member gig and I was going in and I was nervous. I, I was like, you know, fair, I, fair. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I had my business and it was established and we, and I had a good name and I had a rep for, for sculpting accurate uh, monsters, especially Cantina guys. And uh, Kathy gave me this great pep talk for about an hour before that meeting. And I left like, yeah, I <laughs> got this. <laughs> it's totally what I needed. Um, it's so cool. But you know, the, so then through them to have, Bob, when when the American Werewolf was falling apart on him, uh, to say, you know what, uh, Rick Baker tells him throw it away. Rick said to him, you know, it's too far gone, just throw it out. And I, which Bob told me, but I didn't believe. I thought, you know, Bob yeah. is full of stories. <laughs> he's kind of hyper, uh, like he's, he's got a little bit of hyperbole from time to time. And yeah, I yeah. thought, this is just him kind of making a story out of it, right? Um, and eventually, Rick did say he's like. No, I, I told him to throw it away. I, you know, thank what? you. Thank you for doing the impossible. I did not think that could be fixed. I, like, that was my first interaction with Rick Baker. Like, how lucky Dude. can a fella be f for that? I can't, I have trouble wrapping my head around that. I have trouble wrapping my head around that. I got to be close to the wolf from American Werewolf in London, let alone to right? fix it. Let alone to save it. Let alone to make an impression on my hero to, to the point where he reached out to me and uh to the point now where you know we're friendly we can i can you know I, I can drop him a line and we can talk about things and when i when pablo and i figure out something about the cantina and we're not sure about it or we have questions you know, the, literally we forget that we can like call these people like i don't <laughs> Just know ask. Like, what the <laughs> heck is that and then we go oh i guess i can ask rick you know, yeah just, oh wow yeah, I can ask Rick. That's amazing, <laughs> dude. And uh, dude, it comes back to your first, your first uh, 
introduction to Rick Baker was fixing his things, which you were able to do given the yeah. road up. You know? Yeah, yeah, because that became a passion, fixing these these bits of history and helping preserve them. And, yeah. And, you know, and how does that happen? It's error and trial. Yeah. I had I things love that it. went wrong, and I learned how to fix them, and it just made me good at being, you know, fixing things. I <laughs> love I, it. And that was literally it. It was a friend of mine had gotten uh, original props. Uh, it was Brandon from Prop Store, and he had gotten these Ugnots from Stuart. And I had fixed a bunch of stuff. Uh, for myself, but I'd never want, ventured into fixing anyone else's real props. Yeah, <laughs> um, and, and I, you know, fixed real props that were mine, but I felt that was my risk. Right. Um, There's no pressure involved there. It was. It was just. I, you know, it was never even a, a, a thought. Once the over, once that initial fear of like I don't want to mess this up was yeah. out of the picture, the fixing part was sort of natural and it was just about now it was down to researching and learning and learning about the ways museums can serve thing and figuring out how I can apply that in an effects artist's way you know how can I apply the artistic nature and the sculpting sense and the sensibility of an effects artist with that curator's eye that curator's mindset that idea of maintaining as much original material as we can and doing things in a way that is going to preserve uh, rather than just be a fix that will make it till the next shot, which is the way right. most effects guys want to fix. That. Yeah, and, especially back know, then. That's their job. <laughs> yeah. Man. So it was was the Ugnot the first thing you officially restored? Uh, that was that was among the first things that I restored for someone else. Gotcha. Uh, certainly the the first real dramatic restorations. Yeah. Uh, it was a I've set seen the of pictures. four it's Ugnots nuts. over time. Um, they were, that, that was a dramatic change yeah. what I was able to do with them. I, I've seen the before pictures and like, you're basically working with Ugnot scraps that you turned into an Ugnot. How, how do you even attack something like that? It's the same way as anything else. Uh, it is. With a brush. <laughs> that's right. With tools with in your hand. Ah, yeah, exactly. no way, demon Magic. Oh, <laughs> um, yes. No, I, you know, I I often use the crossword analogy when I talk about stuff, and I mm -hmm. do this all the time, and I'm sure the crew is sick of it. Um, <laughs> you knock out the easy stuff first, and it gives you a foundation for the hard stuff. Oh, you know, once okay. you've gotten all the easy words on the board, you've got some of the letters filled in on your hard words, and that's going to help you there. Genius. Um, with the with any restoration, it's the same way. It is figuring out what pieces you have and how they might go together, and then you know just starting to push that that snowball up the hill, sure. uh, you know, or the rock up the hill, and it's and eventually you hit the top of the hill and it starts running away from you down the hill, and you know every restoration is daunting when you first look at it every repair is a moment of worry and a moment of oh, yeah. you know <laughs> can we do this and if you're not thinking that way then you're not being careful enough sure um but it is always as simple as starting um how do we finish this well we start that's how we finish anything that's and fair. as soon as you start it is always a um it's always an interesting challenge and, and there's always twists and turns, but I am, I'm amazed at how quickly you can get something uh, to where, you know, you're looking at it and eventually it's looking at you. And yeah. now you've, you've made this, this uh, progress, whether it's a sculpture or a, um, you know, a restoration, a large scale sculptor, creature, a foam thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, die, you know, make a plan but start. Um, and, and you, you know, from there, that's, that's, that's how you do it. That's, that's where you go. Which, which prop or restoration thing that you built took the longest? Um, would it be the Statue of Liberty just cause size? No, funny enough, that went together almost the quickest. And really? it, uh, part of that was we did a lot of pre-planning on it. Um, even though it's all, you know, it's hand carved. We did, we right. got, our foam in giant blocks and we had a few of the silhouettes um cut mm -hmm. into the foam with uh, uh from the vendor so it came to us with a little bit of a silhouette on uh some of the pieces but 
even with that, you know, if you can picture her head, it was a five foot wide block Yeesh. that had just a silhouette cut in it. So it just looked like a series of lumps from the front that yeah. were five feet wide. Um, but, you know, that was that was at least a starting point And it gave us some line to kind of keep us on track. And it's funny, we didn't even end up using the silhouette that was on there because it was a little bit off when we right. when we actually started carving. We're like, all right, we're going to have to rebuild this nose, aren't we? This is totally wrong. <laughs> These um, guidelines throw them out. <laughs> right. Who did this? Yeah. Um, but that came together in really a matter of a couple of weeks. We we took over a new space uh, in the building we're in, uh, which we've still got now. We filled it with foam chunks and uh, seven or eight of us uh, just attacked foam for a couple of weeks and, mm -hmm. you know, made a giant bust of the Statue of Liberty. And that was, wow. you know, I'm always, I, I, I see people sometimes where, uh, or Rich Riley is a great example of this. Rich is uh, mm -hmm. one of my oldest friends in the, in the business. He works with, with us full time now. He is an amazing foam artist. And what's amazing about Rich is he does plan, but it is he, he – this is why he's here on Earth yeah. to carve <laughs> foam things. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, I – like he'll post up uh, an image and sometimes you'll see people asking and it's, it's – I guess it's just the nature. You know, someone will ask like, well, uh, do you have a list of materials and, uh, and you know, steps that you did for this? And to me, that's just the wrong question. Right. Uh, with someone like Rich, the, the question is not what were the materials or what were your steps? The, the question is, you know, uh, it's not even a question. It's just you know, how did he do that? He had he worked for 45 years making amazing yeah. <laughs> stuff. And then he got some foam and then he turned it into the Statue of Liberty or a Tauntaun or whatever you know, yeah. thing he happened to be working on. You know, I, people ask me, you know, how do you sculpt? And I have some techniques for detailing and things like that and for, um, you know, making cool wrinkles and things like that. And a lot of that I owe to Don Lanning or Jordu Shell, some of these guys that make great videos. If you want to learn how to sculpt, look up Jordu Shell and Don Lanning. Mm -hmm. uh, they're phenomenal. Um, but really to me, it is, I got clay and I mashed it around till it looked like the werewolf guy from the canteen. Yeah. <laughs> like sure. that is, that's, that's all it is. Uh, does it look like him yet? No, mash more, you know, yeah, like exactly. that's your, <laughs> keep going. It's like, that's the diagram on this one. <laughs> that's right. Well, it's like when anyone that's goes the flow in, chart. <laughs> yeah, it's anyone mash who goes more. into stuff like this, they're always like, it, it can't be that simple. You know, they're expecting, like, here's 100 steps. It's like, no, really, just keep adding clay until it looks like it. Yeah. And if there's too much clay, take it away. Exactly. And that's <laughs> it. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it, does it look like him yet? No, mash more. Does it, it look like him yet? <laughs> yes. Stop. Mold. Yeah. Stop, know? stop, 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 stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hard left, hard left. <laughs> that's awesome. So did, did Tom Spina Designs come first before Regal oh, yes. Robot? Yeah, Regal okay. Robots only been around since April of this year. Actually. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So Regal grew out of uh, stuff that Richard and I were doing with Tom Spina Designs. We had, you know, so Tom Spina Designs has been around since the early 2000s mm -hmm. uh, doing custom sculpture, masks and monsters, restoring original props, creating uh, awesome mannequins and displays for original costumes that were worn in movies because you can't just go and buy a Arnold Schwarzenegger ma mannequin yeah. <laughs> at the, you know, the mannequin shop. Uh, you have to come to someone like us for that. Right. Uh, or a Luke Skywalker-sized mannequin, which is much smaller, to fit his original pants and poncho from A New Hope mm -hmm. because we got to do that. Um, what? But uh, and, and so – uh, Tom Sweeney Designs, it's all this wild stuff. We do big trade show pieces. We did the giant foam Statue of Liberty. I yes. love making big stuff out of foam. Uh, Richard loves making big stuff out of foam. And it, through all of that, Richard and I always talked about this idea of like we wanted to see furniture and decor and stuff like that that was propish, yes. that was taking elements from the movies and using them in a different way and – could be painted realistically and could have really cool um, elements in there and, you know, just sort of turn things on their side a little bit. 
And that led us to make the Han Solo Carbonite desk for yes. Mark Hall, who's a Grammy Award winning musician who came to us and said, I want a Star Wars desk. And so we came up with all these different ideas. And, you know, Han Solo and Carbonite was thrown out there. And as soon as that was thrown out, I mocked up this thing on my computer terribly in Photoshop. <laughs> but it was the spark of it. It was like, yes, it goes here. This goes this way. Glass goes on top. And then the pedestals have to have the carbonite symbol on it of that course sort of dot dash pattern and um and that wound up going crazy viral for us sure. um, right in a time so. before facebook yeah. <laughs> um, in a time before twitter um and it really helped kickstart dom spina designs and get us a lot of notoriety and it brought in a lot of other work mm-hmm. um but in the back of our minds it was always like man we should somebody needs to do this and it should be us. Yes. Um, and after years of working with Lucasfilm on things like uh, commercials and working for other licensees like Sideshow, we did their band member, we prototyped their uh, life-size Boba Fett, um, you know, and, and other companies. It was kind of, it became, I, I had talked with different companies about like, you know, maybe you guys want to do this. Um, and it was always just to the side of what they were doing. It was like, no, that's not really our thing or whatever. Right. And, you know, eventually it was just, I was finally in a position. Uh, TSD was successful enough. The money was there. I had the right contacts and, uh, I started to pursue it really heavily about two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea of starting a new company that would focus on doing, uh, themed furniture, art and decor and would launch with star wars as our first license smart um which was uh, pretty good not the easy way to do it (laughs) yeah Um, Yeah. hey it's a pretty good first step (laughs) but i figured if we did that it would at least like we're gonna it's like if if we launch with star wars people will at least notice us and i knew we had the (laughs) ideas for star wars we have so many ideas for star wars Mm -hmm. every time richard texts me there's a there's there's another genius Star Wars concept, and it's just like we are never, we're not going to live long enough to ever make <laughs> all of this cool stuff that we want to make. Uh, but uh, so yeah, and it took a long time to get the right, uh, you know, the, the right alignment of folks at Lucasfilm and then Disney, and to get all of that to just line up just right and get to the right person that wanted to, um, you know, go forward with this with us, and we got the license, and then. Um, it was about a year of, of lead up time, and then this April we launched at Star Wars Celebration. Yes, and your booth was amazing. Thank you. Dude, that <laughs> so was it were you the, the the mind behind the do back couch? So that grew out of that's one of Richard Genius ideas. It's amazing. Uh, he he's famous for he has a line, he just goes, You know what'd be cool? Yeah. And and, <laughs> and then all you we need. all stop and go like because we know it's going to be like, go, go. What are you going to say? <laughs> Whip out a notepad. Um, I'm listening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, that was just, uh, we were, we were talking about different beasts and things like that. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, he just said like, you know, it'd be cool if we could turn a do back into a sofa. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. And, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah, it really was. It was like, what a scoop. You know, yeah, exactly. we both all turned into like 1930s. You, you just point to the <laughs> corner. You, you're on it. <laughs> I want yeah, a piece exactly. by morning. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I want a do back sofa and 400 words on the, on the stock exactly. market by morning. <laughs> and bring me pictures what? of Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> right. I put a cigar in my mouth and I sit at my desk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that was that was just one of those those things he said. And then he sketched it a few ways. We mocked it up with a little hippopotamus, uh, not a hippo, a, uh, a rhinoceros body, because the original Dubak was made on a rhinoceros body. Yes. Um, so we did some mock-ups that way on on like a little toy. And then ultimately, I did a um, a revised version of it uh, digitally that became the foundation for what we wound up doing. Um, and it was interesting because it was, it started off where it was like a full do back and you, it was actually a cutout that you would be oh. sitting sort of inside him almost. Right. And it, it turned into this thing where it's almost looks like he's, he's settling in yeah. and you're kind of like curling up with him and it became really kind of cool and cute. Yeah. I like it. It's like you're, you're in his bed. It's like one of those dog yeah. beds and he's you know? taken yeah. up the rim of it. 
Exactly. And he's and I love the way the head's curled back as yeah. if he's sort of looking back at you like, hey, man. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is my yeah. pet. <laughs> yeah. If you were but... going to be a king, you'd want to sit on something like that. Right. There, there you go. <laughs> um, but it's it's super cool. I love that first movie do back, especially the original you know, non-special edition version, the Fred right. Pearl's uh, art model shop sculpted. It, it's just so darn cool. It was one of the images that fascinated me with Star Wars. The you know it was in the program that you could get at the theater as a kid, and it was the, here is a guy in skull faced armor riding a dinosaur. Right. This is clearly <laughs> going to be the greatest <laughs> film ever. That's right. It and was in our face all along. It, but whatever. Oh, dude, I <laughs> Still, think about there's like a a quick little passerby clip in Rogue One. Of a stormtrooper uh-huh. riding this like beanstalk alien looking War of the Worlds type creature, and uh-huh. it, and it's in the background for literally a second, and it's blurry. And I was like, "What? What is that? What is going yeah. on there?" And they yeah, don't address it. <laughs> I, I see. That's the way I prefer it. Actually, Agreed. I, I like that they do that. You know, it, it feels like modern movies make a point of not only showing everything but saying the name for everything. Like if Empire Strikes Back was shot now you know they would have to say the word Wampa in the movie. Oh, for sure. And it's just like, how would they know that? Did the Tauntauns tell them? You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's called a Wampa. That's right. Wait, what? Did That's you what just the... say something? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like... That's what the pro droid is saying. Bam, 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 bam. They're like looking for Wampas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Looking for Wampas. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. I heard Wampa. I heard yeah. Wampa. It's that's somewhere. what Chewie's saying when he launches. Did you say Wampa? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Oh, gosh. That's no right. No supposed to know. You know? That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's oh. awesome. Oh, man. So you've got, a, you've, got some, you've got some cool stuff in the works. you got some cool stuff. What, what can you uh, tell me? Oh, yeah. We've always got cool things in the works. Yeah, you, you do. I mean, for starters, we've got that huge list of things where Rich said, you know, it'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so so right now we, we've actually so we've got a ton of stuff on the shop in the uh, that's um, uh, really sort of high end. We've got that Han Solo and Carbonite desk, the Han Carbonite coffee table, the asteroid coffee table. Yes. Um, beautiful. These are all things that are uh, very time intensive uh, and and um, high end pieces. Uh, but we've got a few things that are coming out that I think are really cool that are uh, a little more accessible. So we've got a series of pub tables that are coming out. They're what? cafe tables. So they're about uh, 42 inches high. Uh, they work great with our director chairs. Uh, you can get the 30 inch director chairs, which we also have a yes. whole bunch of new designs coming out. I'll get into those in a minute. Oh. Uh, but the cafe tables are neat. They're round tables, and we got to pull all this cool round art from the movies. <gasps> and, uh, so it, you've got things like simple ones like a Death Star from Death Star 2, the Return of the Jedi one. Sweet. Um, but then you've got like the hollow chest board. Yes. Uh, it's a printed top table, but it looks like metal and it's got the, just the pattern on it. Oh my God. Um, and who wouldn't want to sit there with OCD and like rearrange their salt shaker in the different right? checkerboard patterns. Uh, we've got a really cool dark side, light side thing going. We've got a, it's one's a rebel symbol. One's the Imperial logo. They each are made from what looks like two tones of wood. So it's like a, a light, uh, like maple with a dark mahogany. And they are, um, again, it's a printed top, so it's not uh, crazy expensive or anything like that. These will go for two ninety nine with a little bit of shipping. Right on. Uh, they're all made to order. Uh, everything's made in the USA. Uh, yes. It's, it's really neat stuff. Uh, we've also got in that line uh, Boba Fett's chest emblem, the what? Mandalorian crest, yes. all weathered up. And uh, my favorite we we call it the Death Star countdown rebel base doohickey thing. Oh, sweet! Um, <laughs> it's technically Pablo says it's called a hollow tank is the original classic name for it. But uh, mm-hmm. I, you know, so this is though the you know Death Star is approaching kind yeah. of uh, uh, table. And Chris Trevis, uh, who's amazing old friend of mine and amazing Star Wars artist, actually did the artwork on the Boba Fett crest and the uh, the hollow tank for us. Um, and they're they're really cool pieces. That's um, so cool. The director chairs we've got now are um, 
a mix of they're they're much more graphical. The original ones we did were uh, Star Wars Empire Return of the Jedi. We used what they would kind of consider the legacy logos that no one's using anymore because I love like that angled Empire Strikes Back outline logo. Oh yeah. Um and uh, and the classic bar Return of the Jedi logo. Mm-hmm. And what we've got now are uh, we've got a uh, an imperial logo with some cool art that's on a uh, silver print on a black background so to me it kind of reminds me of like the tie fighter helmet where it's the silver symbol on the black yeah we've got a rebel logo on uh an orange uh seat set so it's a little bit x-wing pilot um we've got a han solo set that is the millennium falcon and the blood stripes from han's Karelian pants oh my god um, and a boba fett one that actually is the Mandalorian, the the sort of skull symbol, the mythosaur or yeah. bantha skull. If you're my age, it's a bantha. <laughs> um, not a bantha. Very but a strange bantha. bantha. Um, <laughs> and it, what we did was we added, we had room on the side, so we added in the kill stripes from his helmet on either side. What? Um, and it's just, it's this really cool. It's it's intentionally, uh, you know, distressed artwork, and it is based on the empire strikes back logo and the empire stripes. So like, we're careful about this stuff. We get the details. Yeah. Uh, Oh, but I didn't even mention my two favorites on these. Uh So I didn't know we were going to get it, but we finally got the okay to do revenge of the Jedi and (gasps) blue harvest. What? Director chairs. Oh my God. So we finally have now people can get an officially licensed blue harvest director chair, which Dude. I just think is the coolest thing ever. I'm definitely yes. going to have one in my office. Of course. Uh, of course. <laughs> what else are you going to have uh, in your office? <laughs> and it's, it's the Navy canvas with the white writing. It looks like all the crew shirts and things like that. It's super cool. What? Um, and so, yeah, we've got the whole series of those. There's, there's all there. And we've got the original logos as well. There's all different heights uh you know, three different heights and you can just get the canvases too so if you've got a chair and you oh, say cool. hey i want to freshen it up let me get a revenge of the jedi canvas let me get the boba fett canvas whatever you can do that um and we've got one other thing launching with these and this is might be one of my favorite things we've done yet uh we have made like an actual functional oh my god faux leather soft living room swivel chair out of the emperor's throne what i said we have made oh no you're just (laughs) no i was legitimately unprepared i was like stop swivel what swivels (laughs) what swivels what the emperor swivels when he turns around to welcome duke into his (laughs) throne room as will you (laughs) that's right so be it that's right (laughs) and by it i mean comfortable you know (laughs) but yeah it's it's really cool it's again made in the usa Uh, it's it's a design that i have been tinkering with for a while we looked at you know, doing like a big fiberglass chair or doing something uh, more propish. But for us, it's really about stuff that can be functional, that can blend in, that can, uh, if you, you know, if you know what it is, you know what it is. More, no more one subtle. This is ever going to, any Star Wars fan is going to immediately see it. Oh, yeah. But it could also just look like a pretty sleek, modern swivel chair. Um, Dude. And that's what I love about it. And it's, we found a way to take this thing that is, hard and uncomfortable and huge and couldn't fit through anyone's doors and to find a way to bring those elements together and to make this inspired by piece that instantly reads as the emperor's throne and it's it's so cool man you are not kidding when it's like you know it'd be cool uh yes yes you're right literally there everything you, you we just should said do that and then <laughs> we get to do that because i'm the luckiest guy in the world yeah <laughs> oh Dude. And, and oh my gosh, my uh, our social media guys would kill me for forgetting to say this. So, um, <laughs> but wait, there's I, more. I, there, there really is. Um, <laughs> I, I, and I'm trying to make sure I get the code right here. Of course. Um, when we launch these new products on March 1st, yes, uh, we are going to have. If you if you sign up for our mailing list, you will get a reminder about this. If you follow us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram at Regal Robot, you'll learn all about this. Mm-hmm. But uh, the code new force 20 
will get you 20% off uh, any of these new products. And we might even throw in one or two of the old ones in the, in the sale as well, just for fun. Uh, but so all of the new uh, cafe tables, all the director chairs, in fact, all of our, our full line of director chairs will be 20% off for, for the launch of this stuff. And the new emperor's chair will be 20% off, which is nothing to sneeze at. Wow. That is that that's serious, man. Especially coming up like right before your like one year anniversary of the launch. It's and, it's and, really man. You're right. Yeah, I, I didn't even think about right? that part. But you know what's neat too? We're, we've revised. Uh, we've revised our slight. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to learn how to speak. <laughs> that's right. You know what's neat? We've revised our site a little bit too uh, for this launch. So in the next couple of days, you'll notice that the Star Wars section which used to be just one big section, now breaks down a bit. Uh, in the custom studio, you'll find all of the high-end pieces, all the stuff that we're making custom and made to order. And um, even the Emperor's Chair will be in there, although that's a little more of a piece where we're aiming. Uh, it, it's a much more mass market piece than some of these other ones where we're doing literally a few pieces, a handful of tables or something yeah. like that. Or some cases, one of them, like the Dubak. There is one Dubak. Really? Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. It also, in the custom section, you'll find some of our past custom projects. So over the last few months, we've been doing custom pieces for clients out there, uh, people who have contacted us and said, uh, I really want to see this as a piece for my home theater or for my, um, you know, for my office or whatever. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few of those in there. So now people can see a little more sample of like, well, what does the custom studio mean? Like, what, you mean you just, you know, different colors? That's, oh, no, we mean we'll make a dinosaur into a sofa for you yeah. if that's what you want. <laughs> and, you know, we love that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we've had a few people who came to us with loose ideas or with, you know, this is my favorite scene. What can you do? Or this is what my space looks like. What would look cool here? And they'll commission us to do some concepts. And then from there, if they like the concept, we go forward and we, we make them cool things. Um, so there's the custom studio. There's a furniture section now. And that's where you'll find the cafe tables and all of the um, the director's chairs. And uh, then we've got our art and decor section, which right now is all uh, our series of Mandalorian skulls. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got wall hanging ones. We've got little mini sculptures and the really cool limited edition pewter skull. Uh, which is this heavy, solid metal. Um, it's cool looking. Skull that's just so good. Um, and uh, we've got a few other things in the works for the decor stage that, unfortunately, those I can't share yet. Uh, um, but well, maybe you'll have me back on someday. Of course. Dude, that, <laughs> I, this, see what I did there? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. <laughs> <laughs> Spina is never coming back. That's oh. right. I noted on the blacklist. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dude, this has been so much fun. Absolutely. I've, I've had a really, blast. I'm so glad to hear that. That is literally my goal. <laughs> nice. Well, you have succeeded, sir. Sweet. But yeah, th thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate the time. We've uh, gone well over an hour. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the audience is still around. Oh, please. I've... Next time I'm going to talk about the sale in the beginning. I promise, yeah. <laughs> guys. You know. Not if I have anything to say about it. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, where uh, I've forgotten in the past, but where can people find you online? Uh, so they can find at Tom Spina Designs on uh, Twitter, mm -hmm. Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, uh, at Regal Robot on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, and they can always go to TomSpinaDesigns.com or RegalRobot.com. And, uh, and again, sign up for the mailing list on both of them. That's where people always hear about things first. We don't flood you with a lot of mail. It's like once a month. But whenever we're going to do a sale or send out a secret coupon code, uh, that's how you get it. So, uh, so join us. Sweet. And it's good stuff. It is very, very good stuff. Very Thank high quality. So it's it's just fun to look at. Now wait till you own it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was very kind. Absolutely. And